Tried holding me back, but I'm back to get paid. Deal with it. Deal with it. Get stoked on the head if you step in the way. Deal with it. I just deal with it. Deal with it. Tried holding me back, but I'm back to get paid. Deal with it. When the tears say stop me. No light, no full cheese, uh, but still killing us softly. Yeah, Edgeway Road on Eve, popping keys in the E class Benzie. Fed uh, Zeus, they go be deep, stopping me, cause they all want selfies. Uh, yeah, officer say cheese, fuck your cheese, pull a white on the green, two packs spotted, me and my G. Not so chubby, think I move keys. Ooh, ee, hoo, he do the too deep, you know. Flow to freeze, catch flu at you, your season now. We tap through like Bastion boobies at the bra. We just had that poo, now we go movie stars. Deal with it. Deal with it. Try holding me back, but I'm back to get paid. Deal with it. Get stumped on the head if you step in the way. Deal with it. Yeah. Try holding me back, but I'm back to get paid. Deal with it. Get stumped on the head if you step in the way. You know, another. Yo, what's up? Yo, Riz, it's Jaheed here from Benny. Um, work alongside Nadir on it. We're just setting a few things up. Yeah. All good. How are you? What's up, everyone? Salams, everyone. Salam, man. Salam. How are you doing today? Yeah, good, man. All good. We've got... <clears throat> Bismillah. <clears throat> So how's this work, guys? What's the... Uh... Yo! Hi, to one up, Benny Caravan, sorry. Uh, it's episode two, and today is going to be super exciting. We have an incredible guest today. But before I introduce him, um, let me explain a bit what the Benny Caravan Sarai is. For those that don't know, a caravan Sarai uh, throughout Central Asia and throughout Middle East um, was a pit stop throughout the Silk Road, which was probably one of the most famous trade routes of all time. The caravan Sarai was a pit stop for traders, travelers, people from all over the world to come together on their journeys and to share ideas, to share products, to share um, experiences that they learned throughout their journey. Um, the Benny Carrot, our modern interpretation of that concept, the idea behind it is how can we come together and create a modern pit stop, a modern station that exchanges ideas and, 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 and perceptions and experiences that might embellish um, and help our own journeys. And we wanted to invite some really cool guests and mm -hmm. learn from their journey so that we might um, develop and increase uh, the productivity of our own. Now today, um, I'm going to just say some really quick kind of rules. The idea behind this is to kind of cultivate a community environment where a lot of people can't uh, benefit from community. Some people live in really remote locations. Some people um, don't have access to ideas. And that's really interesting, right? Because ideas is what make us grow and develop. The whole idea behind the space and what we're trying to create through this community is to democratize the sharing of ideas, okay? And through it, we communally grow together and, and hopefully the community can be in better stead to uh, whatever ambitions or whatever um, dreams they have they can go and develop them. Um, now, it's really important that throughout this discussion, we conduct ourselves 
in a way that's really responsible, in a way that's really respectful, um, and the idea is to encourage a space of sharing. So I hope that everyone throughout, whether it's YouTube Live that you're joining us or in the Zoom, that we conduct ourselves with respect, we talk when it's your turn, and um, the most important thing is how, how do we have these discussions that hears different perspectives and ideas in a really respectful way. Um, now, to, I don't want to waste too much time because I want to get straight into the discussion. Now, the person I need to introduce today really actually, for a lot of you, doesn't really need an introduction. Um, but what I will do is introduce him as the individual and the human that I know. And I have to say, he has been like a massive, how do I say it? This is a great opportunity for me because Riz hates compliments and he usually like kind of brushes them over. But I'm going to take this opportunity to say that this person for a lot of us has been an arbiter of what many of us aspire to in a way, not only just in terms of career aspirations, but kind of morals and the ethics and how he's gone about it. He's been a massive mentor to me recently. He's um, really supported me, not only, only in like a professional way, but also emotionally, as you all know, the Nadi family was going through some difficulties, but one of the people constantly checking in on us was Riz. And I have to say Riz, like on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for being that person. It means a lot to us, um, but it just goes to show the consistency of his character. So we're very fortunate to have him here today. And I think I, sp I speak on behalf of everyone when I say that uh, Riz has also lost a family member through this whole COVID situation. And on behalf of everyone, we want to pass your sincere condolences. Our prayers are with you um, and our heartfelt uh, sense of loss is shared truly. So thank you so much for being here today. Riz, say hi. Oh, we can't hear you. Let one say Riz, can't hear you. Ooh, there we are. That? Is that better? Is that working now? One yeah. sec, one sec, one sec. Yeah, you. Okay, great. Well, how's it, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for uh, having me along. Nada, it's so good to, to finally connect with you on this. Man, um, we've been dreaming of this for a long time, bro, man. We've been talking about it for a while, haven't we? And it's, I've just been really inspired to see everything that you do, man, online Thanks, with bro. the run, run clubs, creating community spaces. That means a lot. And, um, yeah, it's been beautiful kind of getting to know you um, over the last couple of years through um, some, well, your family and my family friends. Um, so, yeah, it's good to connect, man. I think it's wicked what you're doing. This is a, this is a much needed forum. So, yeah, let's jump in. Thanks, man. Appreciate you, bro. Now, Riz, there's so many places I could potentially start. But, like, firstly, let's just hear, like, how are you doing, man? Like, is like, it's isolation getting to you? What are you doing to stay sane? Like, what's your, what's been your COVID kind of coping mechanisms, man? Um, you know, I mean, it's up and down. I'm feeling up and down. I think a lot of us are. Um, I guess I'm kind of reconciling myself to the fact that it's okay to feel up and down. You know, for yeah. many different reasons, we often think, you know, we should be productive the whole time or we should be up the whole time i think you know an unintended byproduct of self-help culture and actually quite a big kind of intended byproduct of capitalism i guess is this idea that we always have to be productive you know we measure our value and our contribution by um what we're making what we're selling um and it's kind of interesting because i think you know this whole COVID situation has exposed a lot of things for us. And I think one of the things it's exposed is the world doesn't stop when the rat race stops. You know, right. there is something other than your productivity. There is something other than, um, you know, the daily grind that we used to define ourselves by. And for those of us who are fortunate enough to be able to self-isolate, who aren't frontline workers, who, who are, you know, living in circumstances where we can isolate, there are a different set of challenges that we face. Obviously not as great as the challenges faced by people who can't isolate or frontline workers. Um, but there are challenges. And I guess part of the mental gymnastics that I find myself doing on day to day is like feel, swinging between feeling quite grateful to be safe, grateful um, to be able to self-isolate and grateful to take a breath and get off the hamster wheel and step out of the rat race. But on the other hand, feeling quite purposeless, feeling quite directionless, feeling despair for what's happening in the world and, 
anxiety about the world we might be in after this. And so it's the up and down, yes. that kind of roller coaster is, um, is definitely something that, that I'm experiencing personally. Is that, does that, you know? It does, it does resonate with me in a sense. I think like, obviously my situation was kind of like, um, uh, the added element of like grief, grief and losing someone in this context that we live in. And I think like, for me, it's been, it's been kind of bizarre kind of dream state of really feeling like, whoa, I can't believe this is reality. Um, a lot of our communities and our cultures and our traditions rely heavily on community, like tangible community that you really lean on and you rely on during moments of deep trauma. Like the weird thing about my father passing was that like normally culturally, you know, you have people come to your house every single day, right? Like mm -hmm. they're knocking your door and they're bringing you food and people are there to comfort you and they're reading Quran in the house, etc. Mm -hmm. But through that whole process and isolation, we didn't have that. So, but then I, looking back, it, I've been really feeling like, yo, there's a silver lining in everything. And what this isolation has provided in our case specifically was space to kind of really sit amongst my mom and my sister and really like marinate with our thoughts of, of, of deep loss and grief and have conversations that in any, any normal circumstances we would have had to push forward because mm. we would have been hosting and there would have been a lot of the cultural traditions that we would have had to abide by. So in a weird way, it's really helped that process in some sense to really oh, kind so of, it's given like you, you had no space. choice but to sit with your... Mm, it's giving you the space to absorb yeah. what this is in, in a different way and to take 100%. stock in a different way, right? Exactly. And like, like, you know, like all of us, I think all of us are feeling like, I think a lot of the kind of, a lot of my friends speaking to them, a lot of us are feeling like the mental elements of what isolation means because you've never spent so much time with yourself, right? Like, and you have to confront some of that, some of the stuff that you've been hiding or maybe it's stuff that you've been burying, but like you really have to confront some of the psychosis or, or the burying you've been feeling for a long time and, and mm. in a weird way it has helped us you know, like us raise a sharp focus especially for me to really leverage off this opportunity of really understanding what community means and how important it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and so what and so as this kind of moment led you to reconsider what community is for you it's like and what, it, what, what it can be yeah Hundred percent. Have you have you ever have you had like a have you had like a get out plan? Have you ever kind of thought, oh man, like this is where I thought my life and my work was going, and then this whole situation with isolation has kind of derailed that into a different direction. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, that hasn't happened um, at different stages of, of my own life. Um, I think what's what's really unique about this moment is that we're all experiencing it together, like everyone around the world. Oh, sorry, I think you've frozen for a minute. Have I got you there? I'm not sure if you guys can hear me. Uh, we can hear you. I think he he's frozen. Yeah, oh, yeah. okay, but he's frozen. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I should, I should wait for him. No, dude, so. where'd you go, bro? It's kind of interesting because you asked the question, did you, ever think, did you ever think things are going one way and they take a left turn and they disappear? <laughs> it's like a meta question, trick question thing going on. I'll wait for him to come back, maybe. Um, or should I wait? Um, you guys tell me, you guys who, who are running. You, you can go on, you can go on, answer the question, because sure? we have like a whole audience here, so it would be good if you carried okay. on. So, so tell us like your perspective. How do you feel right now? Regarding oh, okay, this? yeah. Um, wow, I've just seen there's 69 people in this group. There what is, yeah. This is not, I'm putting some gallery view for a minute and to see what's going on here. This is not what I understood to be. What is going on? Hello. It is. Welcome. This is welcome. Welcome. What? This is, no, nah, sorry. Some people are trying to come on without the cameras. Turn on your cameras. You me. I, I just turned mine on. I can see you. Cami, Amina Ahmed, Fatima Onis, Amy Gill, Miriam's iPhone, Ramsey El Daba. Yeah, put the cameras on. Cameras on, Zara Red. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yes, mate. All of you camera off yo, types. Yo. Now, we want camera on. Camera on. Everyone, camera on. Everyone, camera on. I don't care. I don't business yo. yet. Put your cap, put your job. I don't care, mate. Everyone. We, wow. Bro, wow, basically, this is my first Yo, boy, Zoom house forgot. party. This is a Zoom house party. So this, is, <laughs> this is just this is just uncle right now, guest of technology. This is absolutely buzzing. <laughs> this is the biggest group oh. gathering I've attended. In, in, uh, yeah. uh, okay, sorry, Nadia. Yeah, you just had something. I forgot to tell you, Red. I forgot to tell. 
I forgot to sorry yeah yeah you you were chatting shit so I just had to go do something else <laughs> anyway I, I had to like I had to like introduce you to two people who are co-hosting Faisal if you just give us a wave Hi. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and Ali Hi. if you give us a wave hey. they'll be organizing lots yes. of the questions that will come to later but and they'll be co-hosting today so yo Riz let's start at the beginning man I want to hear about like Wembley tell me about like growing up in Wembley what that was like so I mean, I didn't actually grow up in Wembley. I grew up just next to Wembley, Sudbury Town. But people don't know where Sudbury Town is. It's just between Wembley and Greenford and Alperton. Yeah, yeah. And um, and so I say Wembley. Um, but it was it was kind of weird for me, you know, because I did grow up grow up in that neighbourhood. But I also grew up very much outside of that neighbourhood because I went to schools outside of that neighbourhood. And so on a day to day level, what I often found was. I was inhabiting these different kind of versions of myself and they were often quite, you know, extreme in their difference. Uh, you know, I made this, um, I made this kind of uh, short film about it, like in 2014 um, called Daytimer, which kind of like explores the kind of code switching um, that I experienced yeah. growing up. And, and, you know, the, the neatest way to kind of describe it, I'm sure a lot of people here, you know, have lived or continue to live versions of those lives where you might inhabit one version of yourself at home, a different version outside of the home, different version of school, different version with your friends. And I think perhaps, yeah. you know, for me growing up in the nineties, um, you know, there was perhaps less space to inhabit a hybrid version of myself. There was um, yeah. more an expectation to kind of be version A and then version B and then version C. And then the idea that they were mutually exclusive. So there's the Muslim Pakistani working class version of yourself. There's a scholarship kid educated going to a private school to, you know, uh, an hour away from where he lives version of myself. And there's the version of myself that skips off rugby because nah, I'm not doing rugby and goes and hangs out with his mates at Harrow bus station version of yourself. And version A wears yeah. Chilvar Kameez, version B wears school uniform. Um, and the, the Thai, the house that I'm in is Clive House that's named after Clive of India, colonized India. Uh, it's honor of him. And version yeah. C where, where's fake Moschino and Reebok classics. And version A speaks Urdu, version B speaks, yeah. you know, the Queen's English. And version C speaks, you know, just a mixture of the two. And so I kind of found that growing up, I, I, I did grow up in Wembley, but I say it's more accurate to say I grew up in a kind of no man's land culturally speaking between these spaces yeah, yeah. and I think a lot of what I've been trying to do with my work is try and carve out uh, um, make this no man's land a habitable place make it a place where all these different versions of yourself can coexist within you at once yeah so you're not leaving part of yourself at the door every time you enter a room you can bring your whole messy self to the table every time you you, you know you, you turn up 100 percent. and I totally I totally relate with that I think like What's really interesting about you is that like, I've never seen anyone so good at occupying those multiple spaces at once. Do you think like acting was an extension of you having to play a chameleon role most of your life? Yeah, like, 100%. You almost became good at the performance, right? I think so. And in a weird way, I think it's not a conscious performance. I'm sure a lot of people on this uh, call can relate to that as well. You know, it's like not necessarily something you consciously do like i'm consciously going to switch from character a to b to c um it's just different sides of you naturally come out in different circumstances and actually that's very similar to acting that's very similar to writing for any writers over here as well um that's very similar for um anyone who's kind of engaged in anything creative you um you know there are different sides of you that come out in different sets of circumstances. You know, there's a different, you might paint differently on your canvas if you're painting in watercolors rather than, you know, um, spray paint. Um, you know, similarly, when, I'm, when you're playing a different character, uh, you know, different roles in different films, it's, it's the circumstances that change you. The way I like to put it is that like, you know, every planet is held in place, not by what's inside it, but by the things it orbits. You know what I mean? Everything's held in place by its yeah. orbit. And an orbits are relational, you know, um, the position, the angle, the speed of rotation of, of, of every kind of orbiting body is dictated by its relation to other things. So when your relationship to other things, when your environment, when your circumstances shift, that may also shift the, the direction of rotation of your planet and the speed of rotation and the season that's, that's taking place on that, on that planet. You know what I mean? 
Um, so, yeah, in a way, it's very similar. Yeah. It's the same principle well, then, to acting, well, where circumstances um, are what create character, you know? Yeah, but were there moments that, like, to continue your analogy, were there moments that, like, hit you off your axis? Were there moments where you kind of felt like, ooh, is this me? Because you occupy some crazy rooms, man. Like, literally the full spectrum. Are there moments where you feel like, I don't quite belong in this space, or, like, this isn't quite me? I, th I think I consistently feel like that, to be honest. Um, you know, one thing that I've really realised, kind of working with people who are kind of at the top of their game in many different industries, I've been lucky to kind of meet them and work with them, is that that imposter syndrome is is almost universal you know if you're mm. um if you're an extrovert and you find yourself in different circumstances you usually get your energy off off of social engagement that means that you're quite sensitive and attuned to social interactions that means you're probably quite a sensitive person person it probably means you're quite an emotional person right if you're an introvert it's the same thing but you know added to that is probably like you know you're thinking a lot you get in your own head a lot. Either way, self-doubt, the kind of gauging, where do I fit in in this, in, this, um, in this social situation? Where do I fit in in this kind of creative circle? Or where do I fit in in this ummah? Anything like that, you know, that, that kind of um, self-doubt, I think is a lot more common than we actually talk about. And I think that yeah. there's pros and cons to it. And we can debate the pros and cons to it in a minute. But just know that it's quite widely experienced this sense of dude i do not belong here i remember working with i don't know if, i'm working with joaquin phoenix you know on on sisters brothers you know and you know he's 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 full of kind of self-doubt he's like Man, i can't do this i'm not good at this i've got to be a cowboy in this movie i've got to have a gun i don't know what to do i hate this i hate guns i'm not doing this is all you know he has that going on you know and you know i remember jacques odiard the director who directed unprofit i don't know if people have seen that film it's a masterpiece you know odiard also directed deep and beat them my heart skipped you know he's kind of one of the living masters i asked him so look, every time you you direct a film like what do you do what's your process you know like how do you go about it and he just kind of looked at me and goes i don't know what i'm doing and he just walks off like <laughs> i'm just like oh man i'm just praying this guy out massively by asking this question now as I said, there's pros and cons to that. I think the pros to that are that you don't get complacent, you keep yourself on your toes. I think the cons to that can be that you second guess, second guess yourself. And if you don't go from that, yeah. it's useful to inhabit a space of analysis, self-reflection, self-doubt when you're in training mode. You know, when you're training, you want to look at, okay, well, you know, I see you training out there, you know. Uh, sometimes I see like, you know, the precision of it. And it's like, um, um, and, and it's like this context, idea. Of, well, context is like the the, the context well, behind context. this is that. Well, context like, behind this, you, we, go you to the, we, we, we have been to the same gym at different times. It's very intimidating being in the same gym, gym as Nadir. <laughs> yeah. It'd be strange to have <laughs> Zoom without like seeing Nadir's guns. Like, let's, down, see, let's, see now there's guns. <laughs> let's see Nadir's guns. Let's see Nadir's guns. Let's see the guns. We're on a Zoom call. 77 Yo, isolation, people over here. Let's get the guns Isolation's out. been hard on me, bro. Let's get the guns Isolation's been really hard. Wow. Uh, 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 let's see. So, um, but sorry, you know, go this, ahead. But, but this, but this, um, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of it. But I think it can help you to kind of not be complacent, to be self-reflective about your process, creatively about your interactions and all that kind of stuff. But at a certain point, when you move from training to performance, you have to just enter a state of flow. You know, you have to leave behind that self-critical, self-assessment, reflective, kind of, you know. Yeah, yeah. thought pattern and just yeah. enter into a state of flow so yeah. it's useful as long you know that analytical um imposter syndrome thing can be useful because it kind of cheese you up to like don't screw this up don't screw up, you know but then at some point you have to also let it go and then you can come back to it later you can come back to it later and then you know assess your performance like, as a creative or whatever do you think there's something like and and it's almost like a it's like a character trait of an individual. Do you think that could be nurtured or it's something that people just innately have that ability to Which turn, trait? Like the trait to be like, I'm feeling imposter syndrome and I'm going to funnel this into like drive and ambition and focus. Mm. When people they do, like they do crumble under the pressure, the anxiety, the sweaty fingers, the panic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, 
I mean, I think. And like, could, and the question I ask is that, it, like, why Riz? Could it could it be anyone? Could it be any of us? Um, well, in, in terms of like performance, man, I think I'm a really big believer that it's about it's a muscle. You know, performance is a muscle. It really is. Even that kind of shifting of gears, um, I would say, is the biggest muscle. You know, it's like um, as Muhammad Ali said, the champions aren't made in the ring, right? You know, and it's a truism to hear yeah. time and again. It's like it's not about it's not about who's got the most talent. It's about who's um, got the right mind frame. I would say one of the one of the biggest key things for people to focus on um, for their performance, whether it's in creativity, whether it's in sports, whether it's in their jobs, whether it's in their personal relationships, it is actually just the way they approach it psychologically. Now it can start to get slight, start to feel a little bit abstract, but let's, I mean, let's just use the example of like, um, you know, getting up and making a speech, right? So you've got to write the speech, cool. You've got to prepare the speech, great. You've got to have some practice giving speeches, great. Yeah. But I, th I really think that the, the, the kind of factor that sets people apart at say giving a speech or, you know, doing a push up or whatever is the mind state that they bring to it and um i've personally found it really useful to um to practice entering a mind state of of flow and and that's been for me through meditation you know mm. um there's a i kind of think that at its heart you know everything's about letting go of control all the best stuff happens when yeah. you let go of control and you allow something bigger than you and other than you to flow through you. It might be, um, you know, lots of the input you've had from collaborators. It might be all the preparations you've done. It might be the, the Holy Ghost, you know, but ultimately it's about kind right. of letting go of control. So I think um, a practicing, um, sh you know, sh that, that, that psych psychological shift from, um, yeah analytical state to flow state is something that's yeah. so crucial and it's actually kind of shocking to me that we don't talk about it like as, yeah. a, as a as a defined thing because you can set up parameters mm -hmm. around that kind of psychological shift you know um, and it's mm -hmm. true in anything man it's the way you approach your relationships the way you approach approach you know doing your emails you know um it's that same feeling of kind of feeling crushed under the weight of something or um, approaching yeah. it with a kind of lightness and an ease and a flow. As I said, it's kind of tricky to talk about this stuff without it sounding super abstract. Yeah. But in a nutshell, I would say that the biggest thing that's helped me in my performance in the last few years I love that, is, bro. is, 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 med is meditation. You know, when I was doing the night of, I was basically having a, almost felt like I was having a nervous breakdown. It was so stressful going to the gym, you know, like three hours a day, you know, it's half the amount that you go every day, bro. But for me, that was a lot. Uh, doing that, you know, doing this massive role, my first American thing, the hours were crazy. It was super stressful. And I kind of discovered meditation back then in 2014 as something to go, you know what? Yeah. If you try and go, all right, I got to keep, I got to do this and I got to do that. I got to do this. There's all these elements to this performance and I've got to keep them all in play. And I've got, to, and, and I'm interviewing all these people that actually went yeah. to jail and I've got that responsibility. You can't hold it all, it will crush right. you. Um, you know, yeah. you have to let go of it. So can I just interject? So like, I've just got a quick question on the side here. It's just a question is how do you grind, how do you grind your, ground yourself while occupying these spaces? Has, do you find meditation has been the main focus of that? Mm. When you say into these spaces, do you mean entering psychological space like, of performance like, or are you talking about entering social spaces where you feel like an outsider? So I think both like in a workspace as well as a uh, social space where you feel as an right. There's something underlying your question, right? You kind of know as you're asking it, it's the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? Because it's basically about getting out of your own head mm. and kind of putting your focus mm -hmm. elsewhere. It's yeah. entering a flow state, you know, um, a, flow st a flow state kind of listens. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's about kind of like someone's, um, someone told me like, uh, you know, you're not really listening unless you're listening with your whole body. You know, I found that moments when I've kind of freaking out a little bit about like, where am I? What is the deal here? This is awkward. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, yeah. just mm -hmm. listening with my whole body, it just kind of allows you to kind of tune. I think of it a lot of as tuning, you know what I mean? Like 
whatever it is, man, whether it's magic mushrooms or dicker or meditation or, you know, a thousand push-ups, whatever you've got to do, man, to just find that frequency in you mm. that harmonizes with the frequency out there. That's tuning, you know what I mean? The way you tune an instrument. And so much of the light is about just opening your body, opening your heart. And, and so I, I find actually listening is like a very, very grounding thing for me. Hard for me to do, as you can see. I constantly chat. Um, but yeah. but that, that's one way for, for me. For uh, Riz, that was really powerful, man. I love this idea of a flow state, like being a state of mind to kind of help you propel in a state of creativity. And I kind of leverages onto my like next point, I guess, about... I guess you have to tap out of the matrix because the industry as a whole, and I guess the spaces that creatives occupy, opportunity is so scarce, right? Like, like you almost feel thankful for the existence of an opportunity to come to your way. Um, mm. I wonder whether you ever feel the burden of responsibility of like so many hundreds and thousands of people looking at you to represent them in the perfect way. Um, because you're the only one, in, you're one of few, you're one of few people in that space. Is there expectations for you to represent something higher, something like, you know, even more human? Mm, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a weird one, right? So I remember when like, um, East is East came out, that film. Uh, I don't know if people yeah. here have seen East is East. Um, okay, a lot of people here, I'm just realizing just how old I am. Compared to you guys, no one knows about East Disease. So there was a film, yeah? There was a film called East Disease. We know East Disease. Back in the day. We We had this thing, yeah? We had this thing, yeah, called cinemas, yeah? And um, and so basically, like, we had, and and I remember when East Disease came out, and, like, it was sick. We loved it. It was, like, wicked. But also, we were pissed. And we were pissed because it was, like, why are you trying to say that all the Asian dads are, like, drunks that, like, beat their kids? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, but he's not saying that. But the problem is because there's zero other portrayals of Asian dads that year, that becomes an archetypal one. So it's kind of a tricky one because yeah. of the, the, the lack of portrayals, the portrayals that we have actually take on a, a burden that, um, that, that they can't contain. And it's like that thing, it's like, mm. you know, trying to hold on to something you, you'll get crushed under it. Look, all the stuff that's really worth holding on to in life is, is too big to hold on to. You know what I mean? It will crush you under its weight. And the gift of like knowing that there's, you might represent, you know, the, the aspirations of, 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 of a community or, you know, people might, you know, connect to your work, or, you know, on a, on a kind of emotional level. That's a, that's a big thing to hold on to. And, and holding on to it will crush you. Holding on to it will paralyze you. I learned this very early on, man. I remember I did this TV series called Brits back in the day um, on Channel 4. And yeah. it kind of created a big kind of conversation. That was my first TV thing. Um, I, you know, I mean, straight out of the gate, basically, really. It was a bit of a back to, back to the fire because I did like Road to Guantanamo, Brits, all these kind of films that were very much about post 9 11 war and terror um, and trying to kind of challenge some of the stereotypes out there. And what you'd get was you'd get the far right pushback or, you know, just kind of mainstream right center pushback against like, well, should we be telling these stories? Why do we need to see the Guantanamo Bay detainees point of view? Um, you know, maybe this is too, uh, Brits is too, uh, it's too apologistic um, for, um, you know, for, from, for, from radicals point, point of view. But then you also get Muslims going, why are you making stuff about terrorism? Why can't you make other stuff? Or like, uh, how can you say that guy's Muslim? He kissed that girl, you know, or whatever it is. You know what I mean? Like people just, everyone. And I just realized really early on, like, wow, you really can't please anyone. Well, you can't please everyone. You please some yeah. people. But yeah. trying to second guess as to how your work will be received is a really good way of yeah. paralyzing yourself from ever making anything. Yeah. And I learned that early on, man. And, and it's really hard because it's, it's a gift and a curse, you know, to know that those of us, all of us, all the people on this call, I'm sure, in their own way are doing stuff that is that, that that's kind of trailblazing, you know, that is pioneering. And there's a gift and a curse to that. The gift is, is to know that your work might carry a significance beyond just itself. It carries a significance in 
that in the hearts that it inspires or it carries a significance in the in the stereotypes that it challenges you know or in the way that yeah. it stretches culture right that's great that's a gift but it's a gift it's given to you you don't control it you know, you don't get to make the gift list at the wedding and say at the end of this, yeah. when I make this piece of work, I want you to give me the gift of this, 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 that. If it stretches culture, that's a gift. If it inspires people, that's a gift. You don't control the gift. You get given it. Yeah. You don't get you don't get to control it. You know what I mean? And if you do try and control it, yeah. you'll be screwed, man. You'll be screwed. Trust me. Like yeah. I've been there. You you can't go down that road. And ultimately, it's the thing that I realize is like it's hard enough to represent yourself. We have all been taught on some basic level that our voices, our experiences, our stories don't matter, don't count, no one wants to see them. It's hard enough to get around that and do the mental jujitsu to just tell your own story. Just focus on that. You do that, people connect to the truth of it. Just focus on your point of view. You speak with truth, people I guess like the problem it. for me, the problem for me with that is right, like through my own work is that when I, I've, when I plucked up the courage to do that, when I'm shut down by my own people, it feels like it feels like an extra long stab in the back, right? Like an, an, an added pain, right? And like, I know I can draw from my own story. Like when my first video I ever made, and I actually emailed about you about it, the happy video. Mm. Um, it was like this British Muslim happy video. The idea behind it was kind of like play a mm. parody on, on the Pharrell mm. song. And I did the video and I kind of thought, yeah, like a thousand people would see it, but it, it, it popped in a way that I never expected. But then I started getting death threats and I started getting like, you know, like a mob wow. trying to come like come at me. Yeah. And like, and it was like, at that, at that time, I think the space was very different. The way they reacted to these kind of narratives was complete. Like if, if Happy was to come out now, people wouldn't even blink an eye at it, right? But the kind of space period of time. But like, I think it was a really difficult moment for me because I kind of felt like, yo, why am I busting my ass for these people when ultimately like they don't see what I'm trying to, I'm trying to expand, I'm trying to expand the culture. Right? And it hurt me even more than if like the industry and the, the you know, the boardroom of like seven white people were to do it to me. Mm -hmm. No, listen, uh, that's totally human. I, f I feel like that, you know, at times. Um, but when you feel like that, it's a good moment to kind of stop and reflect on why you feel like that. What are the assumptions underlying your work that are causing you to feel disappointed when individuals have individual reactions to your individual output? The assumption underlying the work is that you might speak for other people. The assumption underlying your work is that you can read people's minds. Um, the assumption is, is, is perhaps that, that you can successfully represent 2 million people or 1.8 billion people in a novel, in a book, in a sketch, in a music video, in a rap song, but you can't. To think that you can is itself patronizing. And that's something we've been taught, we've kind of internalized, right? Like, all right, listen, you get one, you right. get, uh, you get Radio One Extra, you get BBC Asian Network, you get your little box over here, you get your, this, put, yeah, you get yeah. your token spot, make the most of it, right? It's, it's really kind of uh, an echo of the kind of in, imperial administration, you know, where you kind of like find a chief of the village and go, right, you report to me, don't have to deal with anyone else. But, yeah. but really, I think what our job is actually isn't to like step up this has kind of been hard for me to accept, but actually it's given me a lot of peace. Your job, in a way, is to make work that inspires enough people and also annoys enough people that they then make work in response to it. Because really, the goal here isn't that it's just me or it's just you. It's that we got all 85 people on this call are like, you know, are out there and are kind of speaking in their mind and are contributing to stretching culture in their own way. And so, and so I guess, it, you know, I, I really believe that in a way, look, you just said it yourself. If you made that kind of um, Muslim happy video now, it would kind of be irrelevant. In a way, your job as someone who's trying to be a pioneer is to yeah. ensure your own irrelevance. Yep. You know, 100%. you kind of want to make work that gets enough people going, well, I connect with it a bit, but also there's something like coming, coming about that's making me itch to like, now nah, I'll do it a little bit like this. And now there's two and someone else sees that and go, what's that about? I'm going to come and step up. Yeah, I want to do this. And before you know it, 
you, you there's like a, there's an ecosystem there's diversity of voices suddenly mm -hmm. there's not three people trying to represent a billion people there's a billion people representing a billion people you yeah, know what yeah, i mean yeah. so yeah. I, in a way i kind of think of it as like it's part of that dialectic now where right. if there are people you know cr you know critiquing the work on the one hand it's an opportunity to learn and grow on the other hand maybe that's 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 the grit in their oyster which will kind of yeah. like get them to get up and make something in response yeah. you know what i mean what well, have you ever have you ever reflected on like like what your role is now like in terms of i guess being one of the, like yeah being an og right like have you considered for a young generation of young creatives who are trying to like uh make a make an impact on this scene have you have you kind of been reflecting what you could do as an individual as someone who carries influence um i guess it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because um, well, that that long silence will make you realise. Like, oh, I don't have a clue. Just no, but you have. Take it there. I knew you were going to say that. But no, I but, but, no, but I would say I would say there's two things I'm tr trying to focus on right now. One is stepping away from this idea of that is that is placed on you by both your own community and other people that you represent anyone other than yourself, right? And trying to really think about, well, what's my voice? What's true to me? Not the voice that, oh, I can spot, someone needs to say that thing and no one's saying it and I can say it. So I'll say, what's, what's, what's my true voice? What, what do I want to say? Just for me, yeah. what's the thing I just want to, what's the conversation I want to have with myself? And then I can let people into that. It's right. trying to work more on that. Right. And, and talk about spe specific examples of, of that in a minute. Um, and the other thing I guess I'm thinking mm -hmm. about is actually community, because I think capitalism sells us yeah. a lot of lies, right? And I think, you know, apocalypse doesn't actually mean the end of the world, the end of anything. The Greek word apocalypse actually means an uncovering and exposing. And this mm. ap apocalypse that we're going through right now is really uncovering a lot of the fault lines and imbalances we have in our society is uncovering the limits of individualism because actually all the biggest things that we have to face, we can only face together. We can only get through together. And I think one of the lies that capitalism, consumerism, individualism tells us is that creativity is, is, is the great man myth. You know, it's the Ayn Rand model of like someone goes up there, usually a guy and like, you know, Steve Jobs creates the iPhone. It's absolutely, that's nonsensical, you know, creativity, 100%. Cultural change happens in community, in conversation. And I'm actually finding it yeah. more and more liberating to remind myself of that by saying, hey, you know what? Um, like, if we can create communities, like exactly what you're doing like this, which I think what you're doing is amazing. If we can Thanks, create bro. communities um, and we can sit around and we can talk and we can share our views, that, 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 kind of reminds us that it's not all on us you know it's yeah. just on you to do you you know what i mean and 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 that kind of community oriented model of creativity which is really what creativity is anyway just really leaning into that thinking about well, how can we bring creatives together in conversation how can we bring creatives together even to critique each other how can we get thinkers together to debate how yeah. can we create that model so you realize you're not there on your own because when you're there on your own you're less likely to speak your truth you know when you know there's loads of other people yes. then you're like well first of all i feel emboldened to speak my truth because i know i'm not here on my jacks second of all i yeah. think i don't need to speak everyone's truth they'll all do that I'm reminded yeah. there are other people here. I'm just going to speak mine. So it's, they go hand in yeah. hand, but I'm trying to kind of embrace a very personal place of creation now rather than yeah. what do I think the culture needs? And secondly, I'm trying to yeah. link more with community, you know? Um, um, that's kind of where I I'm may, If I may, sorry, just um, interject for a moment because we're getting loads of questions. Um, Pfizer here. I just wanted to ask... Um, because we are speaking on creativity, what is it that keeps you inspired and where do you find or draw inspiration from essentially when it comes to your work? Um, I am often inspired in ways I don't fully understand. Um, not because there's any kind of mystical process, but just because 
it's very hard to pin down why something kind of grabs a hold of you. I guess, I guess, you know what? I, um, it's, I, I guess it's like, if there's something I need to work out, I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't know. I'm wrestling with something. That's usually why I create. That's usually why I write music or that's usually why I take on a role. If there's something that I'm wrestling with. So it's not so much like, a ah, oh, I've been inspired and I've got to take this light bulb and I'm presenting it to people. It's like more of a knot. It's like unpicking a knot within yourself. Um, so in a way, I, I kind of think inspiration isn't really the word that, um, that tallies with my experience of like that, that stage in the creative process. It's more like possession. You know what I mean? You're like, you're thinking about something a lot and it's kind of annoying. You can't work it out. And it's the kind of like, you know, they say in Urdu, bijeni, you know, restlessness, mm. you know. Um, then when you start to unpick it, I have moments of inspiration. Like, oh, wow, this bit of this rope can untangle like this. Oh, okay, wow, there's this, this. And then you go back to like being lost in the knot. Um, I, I, I just find very few moments of like real kind of like, ah, release and achievement in the creative process for me it's more just like unpicking it is less uh uncomfortable than letting it be a yeah. knot um and then like for me like like i love the analogy of a knot because when i think about my creative process a lot of what i draw from is like culture and my heritage and my tradition and like and i i do see that also similarly metaphorically as a knot right these are these are these are ropes the fabric that tie us together and and, and dictate who we are in the future but a lot of those ropes also are like deeply traumatic and like issues of like, yes, you want to talk about migrant experiences. You can talk about colonialism. You can talk about a lot of our cultures coming from deeply, deeply, deeply negatively impacted experiences. Right. So when I try to unpack these knots, a lot of what comes out creatively is quite negative and quite like, I, I want to complain about it and I want to shout and scream about it. But like what I've been really interested in recently is like narratives that are devoid of that kind of, heaviness right like a lot of like the creativity that i think our communities are coming out with we start with the, the trauma right it's the beginning it's the birthplace of our creativity do you think it's possible for us as like minority communities to build things that are entirely devoid of that should we do that um because undeniably these these are part of who we are um but is the goal is the benchmark to reach a place where like we are creating art just for the sake of its beauty not because it's linked mm. to something deeply traumatic. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting um, question. I know we've had this debate as well ourselves. You know, we were talking about The Long Goodbye, for example. So I made this short film to go with my album, The Long Goodbye. And it's kind of, um, it has moments of kind of everyday kind of joy of a brown family, but it also has some really traumatic scenes yeah. in it. And, um, uh, and, and it's interesting because I have the same, I have the same thought really i think like i don't do i want to be making this wouldn't i rather just be making like some romantic comedy and again it's like it's the gift and the curse there is a there is a curse that those of us from certain communities who have trauma in their stories and have traumas in their present moment um may find themselves tasked with addressing that and unraveling the knots of, the, of that trauma, right? Mm. And that can be burdensome, that can be heavy, that can kind of like marginalize your work into like some niche space at the back of the record store with world music, you know, with the subtitled sections, political art over here, not mainstream. That's the curse. The gift of it is, I do also think that can be the highest calling of art and creativity. Mm is to unpick those knots of trauma which is an incredibly healing process mm -hmm. is to shed a light on those scars that people try and cover up i think that's a very brave thing to do mm -hmm. and so i do think that there's this i'm in two minds about it myself mm -hmm. now for me personally i think that trying to kind of engage with the reality of <clears throat> who i am what i'm thinking about what's on my mind right now without really engaging with some of that trauma some of that heat some of that hate some of that fire that we find ourselves in right now it would just feel dishonest to me that's just me yeah personally it would just feel like weird and right. and, and and let me let me tell, let me put it like this let me say that the long goodbye was a film 
where it was just, it was, you know, the, the long goodbye for the people who haven't heard it is like, it's a concept album about a romantic breakup, but you're actually breaking up with your country. Yeah. So it's a breakup album with Britain, right? Let me say, if, imagine if I'd made a short film where it's just me and, you know, an actress playing Britain or whatever, and it's just a love story. Imagine if the short film is just me going to the shops, buying, a, you know, a pint of milk, going home, making a milkshake and smiling at the camera. <laughs> Now, weirdly, there will be something radical about that as well. Yeah, exactly. For the inverse reason that you're saying, right? It's like... Yeah, you made it. But the, the Muslim guy is doing it. But where's the trauma? Where's the hate? Where's the where's the MI6 kicking down the doors? Where's this? It's that. Great. And yet, do you see, by its omission, it's still, it's like, as soon as you said elephant, the elephant's in the room. So the only reason it's radical is by its omission of something that we know is in the room anyway. Yes. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so whether you engage with it or not, it's in the room. Yeah. You can choose to not engage with it. That's a radical act. I'm not engaging with it. Or you can engage with it. But yeah. don't make no mistake. It is in the room. Yeah. I mean, I it's remember... It's to you how you engage. I remember, I remember coming to your screening for The Long Goodbye. Um, and it was like the first time you'd shown it, I think, in public, right? To a public audience. And I remember watching it. And if I could describe the feeling to everybody, like after the credits had started rolling normally normally at these things there's applause right and people are like you know Riz is there and people are applauding there was just like silence there was categorical like you could hear a pin drop and like you could feel how this video had impacted people on a deeply profound level and I couldn't help but feel like what's the next step from that how do you turn that feeling they're feeling into something like tangible that can move the plates of the industry into something more, I don't know, um, more, more meaningful or more, or more impactful? Mm. Well, I mean, I guess looking for a one, one-to-one -one relationship between art and social change is always doomed. It's very, very rare for that to happen, right? Mm. Um, <clears throat> I mean, with the exception of maybe the French movie Indigen, I can think of at the top of my head, which is about, you know, World War II, uh, platoon of North African soldiers that fought for France um, and, and that the, these uh, North African soldiers were never kind of granted their medals of honor and proper pensions and, yeah. and all this kind of stuff and that film was made and it was a box office hit and they went oh god we're going to change that law actually we've got to give these guys their pensions and give them their more medals and recognize them as French soldiers it's very very rare that you kind of have a work of art and then right off the back of it you have some social change or legislative change or yeah. you know it the change creating is an act of faith because you it's like praying in it you just like pray and it just like kind of it kind of goes off into the ether yeah, yeah, yeah you kind of hope it gets the way you want it to go but you can't quite measure it you know yeah. and that is what it is it's kind of like whispering into people's ears or hearts you know yeah, and kind of hoping that it no but that, that is what that, no but that is what it is because you don't know where it lands you know you don't know what seeds that 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 get sown from that um so i don't know i mean i guess for me the thing is if it creates some conversation that's some stuff you can measure you know um and if it causes other people or you to also continue to create more work mm -hmm. i think that's good i think those are two kind of good things you can measure you know the, the the texture of what that conversation is will be different what kind of work is made of that might be totally same might be totally different but yeah. if it's if it's if it's if creating um creates more creativity yeah. then i think that that's that's your kind of job in a way is to like hone in on 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 that yeah. I think but I guess the kind, of, yeah. the kind of confidence that you demonstrated with a long goodbye was an amalgamation of all the work you've done up until that point right like like I feel like the plates have shifted to that precise moment where the long yeah. goodbye has become possible right and like I wonder now I don't know if you have any idea of like what 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 would the the creative cultural output be as a result of something like the long goodbye because now you've opened the doors right where something so outrageously unapologetic can be played. Um, I kind of, I, I'm really curious to see where the community takes that and like how it can inspire young people to start thinking, you know what, I don't need to shy away from who I am. I don't need to shy away from my deepest, darkest, deepest, dark, darkest secrets. Uh, this is how I feel. And I'm going to publicly put it out there. And I think that video really did that because it was so outrageous. Oh, thanks. 
Well, man, you know, it's interesting because I, for me, one of the the most satisfying things, you know, he's talking about what you can't measure much about making work. You know, yeah, you can measure views, you can measure sales, but yeah, as all of us know, you know, Instagram generation, that, that's a that's a kind of mental vortex. You know, you don't want to start chasing that weird dopamine validation. It can really skew your output. Um, but yeah. one of the things, the nicest things someone can say about something is like, man, like you said what I was thinking or like, I thought I only th- felt like that, Yeah. but now, you know what I mean? And actually the way you arrive at that isn't by guessing what other people are thinking is by saying really honestly what you think in terms of what something like the long goodbye album and short film might open the doors to maybe it is just, you know, Nadir walking to the shops and buying a pint of milk, Yeah, you know, without any, you know, without even being silly about it. I yeah. mean, who wouldn't watch that video? But <laughs> is this idea of like, kind of, you know, I, I wrote this um, article in the Guardian a few years ago about kind of representation and stuff and, and about being stopped at airports. And I, and I figured there's like, it works, representation works in stages. You get a stereotype, then you get the thing that challenges the stereotype. Yeah. And then you get the thing that's just the thing. It's just not even engaging yeah. with it. It's not even, yeah. I do think you often have to go through those stages. Yeah. So yeah. I would love it if because of the work that I've done with the longer buy, you know, you can just have a guy walking out. Cause in a way it's like, you've got to say it before then you move past it. Yeah. You've got to say elephant in the room, safe, cool. Yeah. 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 But we're not riding elephants today. We're doing something. Yeah. Else. And I think my putting a hand up to my mistake was that I was skipping those two steps. And my, and my revolution was like, F that I'm just going to like, I'm just going to like create stuff that like is detached from that. But then you realize that your audience haven't had the luxury of going through step one and two, right? Like, this is what you're saying. You need to take them with you on that journey. Mm. Yeah. I mean, at the same time, you've got to just speak your truth. You know, there's certain people that might just go like, listen, man, I'm not trying to make anything about, all the, you know, yeah, we're in a house is burning down, but I'm not talking about that. Yeah. You know, something that I've been thinking about a lot actually is um, magical realism and also thinking a lot about Afrofuturism yeah. as a genre of music and film. Yeah. Okay. So the Afrofuturist movement. Um, oh God, if my blanked right now, if, is the author's name Octavia Butler? Is that right? Can anyone tell me that? Yes. Google team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh God, I'm losing my brain cells. Yeah. Um, so reading some of her short stories, listen to the music of, of um, bands like Sun Ra. Um, if you listen to Sun Ra Orchestra, Space Orchestra, if you listen to Four Hero, just in Northwest London, Dollis Hill, and their drum and bass and new jazz breaks and how they believe it's like alien communication, look at the architecture of Zaha Hadid. I've been asking myself, what does Islamofuturism look like? Yeah. Because if reality and telling stories in our contemporary reality necessarily is a space of oppression where you have to either engage with the oppression or ignore the oppression, but either way, even by its omission, it's in the room, this still casts a shadow, then actually the imagination becomes a really important space for liberation. The imagination world building, you know, is, is a space where you can completely kind of wipe the slate clean. You know, yeah. and so I've been thinking a lot about well, I don't know what is Islamofuturism, what is magical realism within our context. Uh, you know, I really loved um, Mohsen Hamid's book Exit West for this yeah. reason. You know, yeah, yeah. and and I'm just thinking about that, thinking about you know if yeah, yeah, that's dope. That's yeah. seriously powerful. So, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what that if that kind of opens up possibilities for us to yeah, really dictate the terms of our own story because i think something that you were saying now there was you know i feel like there's this debate going on but as soon as i like and, and I've, someone's got to jump into it but when i do i feel like a hamster on the like yeah. colonial hamster wheel or yeah. whatever yeah. um you know i think th- th- there's truth to that you know ultimately for me at that moment that time i felt the most honest thing i could do is say what's in my mind and what's in my heart yeah. it connected with people but we do absolutely need to make a diverse range of different pieces of work you know 
love that. I think that's super powerful. Um, it's got me thinking, and I think it will inspire lots of people to start thinking like what those steps are and what, what that looks like for their own, whatever you do. Um, time is short, but I would really love to encourage people to ask questions. A lot of this is about democratizing uh, a space for ideas and for you guys to engage. So Ali and Faiza, are there any questions that people would like to ask? We have Ingrid? so many questions. Ali, do you want to start with the ones on YouTube and then I'll go ahead. Uh, yes. So many questions. So many. Um... This is like, everyone's just so excited. So we're trying to pick out the questions. For you. A range of questions. As well, like... I'm seeing a lot. I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Zoom chat about now there's uh, milk put it out there you put the energy out there bro let's do it i've got the next uh, viral thing whilst we're waiting for the question selection i think this is a good time to announce riz has been begging me to be in his next movie and you know i've been like kind of reticent because i'm like yo you know yeah, like exactly. acting's my thing the opening credits is just riz has been begging shot. me calm He's down give me a lot mm -hmm. and i've been like guns yo, glistening i want to do this milk scene then we'll do this milk scene. I'm all right. Yeah. I'm cool about it. Let's do it. <laughs> milk movie. That's a summer. Rare. You already did that, Sean. Uh, good? It. Yeah. So I'm just gonna ask a question from Naim. Um, his question is: um, a lot of creative and minorities have like made it into mainstream with film, music, but what is the ultimate goal at the end? Um, you know, is it just a case of that they just want work, or is there? Do you think there is a goal that they want to achieve? Um, I mean, I think the, the thing you have to always follow is your curiosity, is your creative curiosity. I think that's the thing you always got to follow. Um, if you going into it specifically to represent stuff, you should stand as a politician, you know, um, now the awareness that you might represent some points of view or some people that aren't otherwise represented, that can be your jet fuel. You know, that can give you your gas, but that shouldn't be your GPS. Your GPS has to be your own internal. It has to be your own curiosity. You know what I mean? So be, having an awareness of that, having that connection to something bigger than and other than yourself in your work. Yeah, I would say that's your fuel, but that's not your steering wheel. That has to be your, your own curiosity. Amazing. Um, we have another question here from Labia. Um, always having the collective trauma at the forefront of your art and voice to the point that you're constantly on the defense in it, in it of itself. Is it also being true to yourself? Like how, how long can we look back uh, to our collective histories and project it to our future? What do you think is the best kind of approach for that? Should we try to create a future devoid of that trauma instead? Like how do you think? Mm we can go about doing that for the future. Yeah, I, I think I think the right answer is to have multiple different responses, honestly. Right. You know, I think what Chimamanda spoke about at TED Talk once is the danger of a single story. You know, if all our stories are kind of completely just avoiding the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. and we're not talking about the fact that we're in a house that's on fire, we're not yeah. talking about what the reality is for lots of people of color and Muslims around the world, and you're making that art, then that's problematic. If we're only doing that and everything's just about that and we don't have any just rom-coms with Nadia going down to shop buy milk, that's problematic as well. You know, yeah. um, I think that I think we need to have that diversity of responses. And, and I think the thing to think for artists and creators watching and listening and thinking about what they want to do is not what do we need? It's what do I need to get off my chest? You know, because honestly, man, it's just not going to be good unless it comes from a really personal place. It's just not, people won't connect to that, you know what I mean, um, in that way. And so um, and that's something I'm, I've learned, you know, I've made some terrible things that I've just been like, I've been thinking about second guessing, what does, the, what does the universe need and how can I help serve this? It's like, dude, go on, what are you doing? Just connect to your, your truth and express that. So I think the re that the answer is actually to have multiple different approaches. And as we were saying before, actually talking about a futurism that is, that is, um, you know, uh, that takes in alternate histories. You know what I mean? Um, it is really interesting. You know, that's why I'm thinking, you know, sci-fi fantasy futurism, it's an interesting space, I think for, and traditionally always has been for, for oppressed people, marginalized people to kind of like redesign their stories. 
Yeah. I think last, that's something that could be interesting. Last, uh, last two questions, and I just wanted to butt in because we've had a really good question. And someone was asking Riz if you had any prominent or influential women in your life that played a role in 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 your development, your upbringing. Who were they? Yeah, of course. I mean, my mum, my mum, my sister, um, my aunts. Um, yeah, I mean. I mean, I'm sure a lot of us have kind of come from backgrounds where our parents have sacrificed a lot to support us. And that's certainly the case for me. Um, just kind of opening me up to the kind of experiences, the kind of education, all that kind of stuff that my mom really kind of single-handedly um, kind of just broke her back and went out of a way to do mm-hmm. is... Um, is what has allowed me to have the life that I, that I, you know, have today where I've been open to those experiences and those experiences have, have, have molded me. Um, my mom's also just a very big personality, you know, she's like always just playing different characters and stuff. Oh, I remember just as a kid, she's like do all these mad different little voices and that, and that's like how we used to play. We used to like do these little characters to each other and stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just like, um, but is there anyone in the industry now that you think like is an impressionable young woman who you think is doing some incredible stuff? Some amazing young women that I think are great. Yeah, like if you were to write, like for example, let's say you had like a metaphorical mm-hmm. daughter. We all wish in the future we'll have a real one. But like, who would you like her to kind of be inspired by? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I'd like her to do her own thing. But I mean, I would say that someone who I think is uh, really inspiring is um, Sahema Manzoor who's a spoken word artist, who I thought is just, just, just the quality of her work is really, really high. It's really, really strong. Um, um, it's really thoughtful. You can tell it has a very clear vo- voice, um, very personal voice. And then outside of that, she's also been campaigning for example, to try and you know campaign to bring British nationals back who've been stuck overseas in Pakistan. Um, actually, you know, to, to speak to some of the issues that we've been discussing today, actually, it would be really good for you to maybe have a conversation with her at some point because yeah. <clears throat> she's talking about, I remember one of her favorite poems that brought to my attention is this is not a humanizing poem. You know, it's this poem which is basically like, nah, this isn't a poem where I tell you Muslims are human beings. No, nah, this, this is a poem where I say, Engage with our humanity, even if we're unwashed, unemployed, uneducated, lazy, on the dole, you know, spitting on the street. What? We're humans. I don't. I shouldn't have to tell you. I mean, so anyway, I think she's <clears throat> super interesting. Um, yeah, as someone who's just come Mate. to mind. Now, real quick, because time is short. Last question. We have a special guest for you. Is you ready? Um, Saladin, you there? He hasn't responded back to my message yet. Uh, Salaam alaikum, Riz, Rizwan. Wa alaikum, bro. How you doing? It's good to see you. Good to see you. I should yep. say the reason I know the reason I know Nadir is because of Saladin and hey, his hey. family. And uh, yeah, he's Saladin's late brother. May Allah rest his soul. Saladin Ameen. put us in touch, and when we were um, by his bedside in his final days, he said, "I want to to make sure you link up, you connect with Nadir, and uh, you guys are going to do some stuff together." Beautiful beginnings, oh, man. So it's good to, uh, yeah. Alhamdulillah, it's just a privilege. I have to say, like, uh, be, uh, I, just, I have to always be grateful to Riz. Like, you know, you see, like, all the, you know, big person. And then, like, for the little people like us in life, you made time. So I just want to wow. thank I want to thank him. But, um, I just, well, my question is, um, how do you keep yourself grounded in a big industry like Hollywood and a lot of the fame that you receive? What do you... Like what keeps you grounded? What keeps you humble? And then also in a big industry like Hollywood, how do you make sure that your narrative doesn't get lost amid like and subsumed in Hollywood? Um, Stay true to yourself. I think it's like quite human to not always stay grounded, man. Sometimes you get super gassed and you start feeling yourself and you get complacent and you kind of like... You know, you're like, yeah, man, I'm doing the thing, you know? And, and you're like, and then you put yourself in this kind of thing where you just kind of build yourself up on vapors and then one bit of hate or one thing comes and you're like, oh. And you realize, okay, I was just like floating around on these kind of digital fumes. Um, 
sometimes you don't keep it grounded. I think that's okay. You just try and remind yourself over the long run. It takes a long time, I think, to kind of find that evenness. You know, you still go up and down before, oh my God, I'm king of the world. I'm, you know, I've got a song on TV or something. And then, you say, oh my God, I'm never going to make anything again. And then it kind of evens out a bit more. And then you're kind of more like, oh, that's nice. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, you know, and that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean you enjoy it less. It just means you're enjoying something different than, than the reaction. You're enjoying the satisfaction of like, oh, okay, I unpicked that knot for myself. Okay. Yeah, this is this is a testament to what I feel about this thing right now. The long goodbye, this album. This is this is this is how I feel about that. Okay, cool. And so you get, um, but I don't think you do always stay grounded. I mean, I think something that does help, I think, is as I'm finding later, I say later in my life, but more recently, is some kind of spiritual practice, whatever that is. It could be jigsaw puzzles, it could be, you know, your religion, it could be meditation could be just something bigger than and other than you some people find it in surfing you know getting the ocean to like put you in your place every day um something that isn't about work that is that, that is about you showing up with some humility i think that can help and I, honestly i think another thing that really helps is people is friends you know we're all going through this crazy covid time together and I don't know about you, but I kind of yo-yo between wanting to talk to loads of people and not wanting to speak to anyone and feeling quite down. And I find that it's actually in those moments I need to reach out the most, man. That's when I'm most in need of a, like, just a little laugh, you know, someone to just say something silly, Nardo to show me his new haircut, something like that. And, um, <laughs> but, um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Riz. That is um really... Man, there was so much to take away from that. And I think all of us, I can feel it. People are messaging me. You're feeling mad inspired by some of the gems you shared with us today. And um, we want to thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. We hope thank it's, you, man. Uh, what a beautiful opportunity to chat to you guys. Thank you. Hopefully next yeah. time get to hear from more of you guys with more time. Definitely. Thanks for uh, yeah coming to another. Yeah, big up everything you're doing, bro. Thanks, bro. Big up everything you're doing, man. And 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 I know, you know, we all send you our of uh you know condolences and love for what you and your family are going through right now thank and i know you. for what your father stood for i know they'd be very proud of what you're doing right now man appreciate you that means a lot to me and and yeah i hope it's the first of many many discussions and raise like on behalf of everyone thank you so much hanan if you could just do the concluding statement of what we learned today and then we'll draw the meeting to a close thank you everyone for being here we love you okay hi everyone yeah i'm hanan hi Riz. thank you so much for what you've shared with us today i think I can speak for everyone when we say that a lot of what you said resonated with us. And one thing that's good about this Carbon Sarai platform, what we want to do is to have people have things that they can take home with them on their own journeys through life. And a few things that I've picked up from this conversation I'm going to share right now. And maybe after this, we can compare notes. I saw a lot of people writing their own notes down and people have been like shooting in the comments going like, ah, oh, dropping bars. So like you shared a lot of things that have resonated with all of us. So you touched on things like identity, representation, culture, feeling in between, feeling imposter syndrome, all of these internal conflicts due to external circumstances. And I think that's something a lot of us resonate with being in a cultural no man's land and having to negotiate that and not feeling like you can belong or fully be yourself in the spaces that you inhabit. And what I found from the conversation, a kind of theme that emerged that was significant was this, I think it was what you just shared with Salahuddin as well, uh, about turning to something bigger than yourself. So whether it's connecting to community like spaces here, or what you said just now, which was really powerful, which was tuning into the flow state. So finding a way to access your flow state, whatever that might be, whatever your form of med meditation, find that meditation and access that flow state to kind of also just let go, surrender to this thing that's bigger than who you are. And I thought that was really powerful because what you kept saying throughout in different places was it's not just about yourself. Even when you were talking about uh, being a cultural pioneer, you were talking about people who stretch culture. Ultimately, you were saying what the job of that person was is to, what the job I think all of us have who are going against the cultural grain is that you want to also, uh, your job is to ensure your own irrelevance. I think that's what you said, which means to create a conversation means it's not just something that you're doing for yourself. It's something that creates a conversation amongst people who are like-minded or people who think differently to the point that that becomes normal or that becomes a new neutral. And that is some really powerful stuff. There's real empowerment in that. 
in creating a conversation, in creating something that extends beyond yourself. But again, I guess the thing that I'm taking away personally the most is the whole thing about tuning in to yourself so that you can find the best, I think, version of who you are, or the most, most authentic flow of who you are, whether that's from a creative perspective or whatever it is that you want to access in your life and putting that out there and uh, finding the communities that resonate with that or like creating stretching culture through accessing something that's authentic to yourself. And I think that's something all of us can really do and can take with us outside of this caravanserai. So thank you so much. For that thank you, what an amazing sound summary. Wow, I, I had no, no idea what I said. I was like, yeah, <laughs> write that down, that makes sense. That's why, that's why yeah. she's there. But Tahana, yeah. thank, you so much. thank you so much. That was beautifully summarized. Yeah, thank uh, you. Well even inspired. Keep doing you, man, and we're always here to support you. Much love to everyone. Please stay safe. Please stay at home. Make sure everyone in your family stay at home. I know how the elders can do it. Take Take it easier. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Tune in next week, fam. Peace. Uh, Our next guest next week. Um, Usually it's on a Wednesday, but because of uh, Ramadan approaching and some other schedule clashes, we had to do it on Tuesday. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the chat. I know I'm feeling like mega gassed and inspired and and Riz is kind of like, just like, uh, kind of rocket. You just kind of, you light him and then he just kind of explodes and things are born from the conversations that happen. I hope you feel inspired. And a large part of what we're trying to do here is to uh, create spaces to be inspired. Like a lot of these conversations happen in ivory towers. And what I realized that actually it's a massive privilege to be privy to some of these conversations. And a big part of what we're trying to do today is uh, provide this to people who live in really remote areas, people who don't have access to that kind of privilege. How can we democratize this process so that even more of our young people are feeling emboldened and and inspired and motivated to create beautifully Mm -hmm. and authentically? Um, And I hope that makes sense. I hope that's coming across. Pardon, uh, forgive us if there's any like niggling issues with technology or, or it's not as slick as it can be. Uh, This will grow and hopefully it will become bigger and better. And we've got some really exciting, amazing guests for you, people who are pushing culture. And I can't wait for you guys to kind of witness that. But thanks for tuning in. We'll see you, inshallah, next week, Wednesday. Uh, If we don't speak... Final note, final note, final note. If we don't get that milk content by next Wednesday, (laughs) I ain't attending. We need the milk... I'm going to get you. I'm going to make a little a little private video of me getting the milk for you guys. The milk movie. The milk movie. It needs to happen. Also, with the people I hear, Riz is gone. But just want to thank the team. Also, like, part of me in the beginning, I didn't actually introduce Ali and Pfizer, who did a great job. All of right, guys. <laughs> the conversation. But thanks so much for that. Um, Hannah beautifully concluded. We appreciate you. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in as well. Like, like the reason why we guys, we allow you guys in the Zoom chat is to kind of create that lounge environment, right? Like, like that, 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 that kind of hospitality you might witness at home and people like got tea and whatever. Like we want to feel like we're in the same room together. So I hope you're feeling that kind of hospitality that we're kind of creating. Any feedback, please message us. But only the good stuff, the bad stuff keeps yourself. Um, but no, I'm, I'm serious. If there's any constructive feedback, we'd love to hear it. And, uh, and yeah, we love you guys and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Love, love.